Good morning, everyone. Old Blue Eyes is back with another research update ending the week of July the 21st. I've escaped from my assisted living facility just long enough to review a few articles with you this morning. You can find all the rest of the research published in the past week in the thumbnail sketch that goes along with this video. As usual, I don't review master's theses or dissertations or research involving animals in these weekly updates, just clinical research. We're going to start with a paper that is a follow-up to the uh, video that I released a couple of days ago having to do with whether stimulant therapy in childhood or adolescence is associated with an increase in substance abuse, particularly for stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine later in life. Uh, and we concluded there that there simply was no evidence from the more than 17 studies that I reviewed uh, that stimulant therapy prejudices ADHD individuals toward a greater likelihood of stimulant abuse or any substance abuse. Well, lo and behold, this week out comes yet another paper on this topic. This one involving a very large sample of high school seniors who were followed over a six-year period of time here in the United States. Uh, this article, as you can see, appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association on their network. Uh, this is an open article that you can read on your own. So let's sc scroll down here and take a look. This study is using 5,000 students who were enrolled in this rolling assessment over three waves, a six-year follow-up of these high school students, up to the age of about 23 to 24 years of age. Now, uh, among those enrolled, there were about 470 who reported taking stimulant medication. Uh, and uh, that's about a rate of 10% of the population that was on medication at that time. Uh, not an unusual percentage for students in the US. Uh, we also found that uh, there was 14% of this sample had been taking prescription stimulant medication uh, without being prescribed the medication. Now, that's important because these you would, I guess, call experimenters or even abusers who are taking this medication illegally. They weren't prescribed the medication. They weren't diagnosed with ADHD, but they're using it anyway. So in this study, they're going to compare the students who took stimulant medication appropriately at follow-up for their use of cocaine and methamphetamine. And what did they find? There was no statistically significant differences between adolescents who reported stimulant therapy legitimately for ADHD at baseline compared with population controls when they were followed up into their 20s in terms of their transitioning on to cocaine or methamphetamine initiation or abuse. So, once again, we see yet another study that shows that treating children with stimulants in childhood or adolescence, in this case, does not lead to later stimulant drug abuse. However, look down here. In contrast, the group that was illegally using prescription stimulant medication during adolescence did go on to have a higher odds of transitioning to later cocaine or methamphetamine initiation. So, excuse me, there's a fly here in the room who's decided he wants to be part of my video. So, uh, in any case, it looks like it's those adolescents who are illegally using substances that is causing the problem here. Uh, that is, it is at greater risk of stimulant abuse later in life. To put it another way, if you're already likely to abuse stimulants illegally in adolescence, you're more likely to do so in adulthood. Uh, so a very interesting study that not only supports the conclusion reached in my earlier video about stimulant treatment not predisposing to stimulant abuse later on, but suggesting that if a teenager already has a pattern of stimulant abuse or use illegally, uh, 
then they will go on or may go on to have a greater odds for stimulant uh, abuse, cocaine, methamphetamine in this case. Okay, let's get rid of that paper and let's move on to another one here. And this one deals with a related topic of the risk of later substance use disorders in people with ADHD who may or may not have comorbid oppositional defiant disorder. Now, this study fits in with some videos I'll be releasing in a few days that have to do with the comorbidity of ADHD and substance use disorders. What does it mean for understanding ADHD? What does it mean for diagnosis? What does it mean for treatment? So expect uh, within the next few days, I'm going to be releasing videos on this topic. But I thought it was worth at least mentioning that as I talk about in those later videos, here is yet one more of many, many studies that demonstrates that ADHD in childhood or adolescence predisposes to a much higher risk of substance use disorders by adulthood. And in this case, it didn't matter whether the individual had oppositional defiant disorder or not. So if we scroll down here, we'll see that this was a very large study of a birth cohort in Finland involving over 6,000 individuals who had been followed up over time and examined for whether or not they had had a diagnosis of ADHD or ADHD with ODD by age 16, uh, and then whether or not they qualified for a substance use disorder up until age 33. Uh, and what did they find? Well, very simply, we'll just cut to the chase down here. The odds of someone with ADHD going on to have a substance use disorder was nearly four times greater, 3.84 as you see here, than the population control group. So clearly, ADHD biases toward SUDs or substance use disorders. They then went back and readjusted for a variety of possible confounding factors involving sex, family structure, parental psychiatric disorders, uh, and uh, earlier substance use uh, in association with ADHD. That is, did they have ADHD at the beginning and substance use disorder already? So they controlled that out of there as a possible confounder. Even then, they found that the odds of having a substance use disorder were more than two and a half times greater by age 33 if they had ADHD in childhood or adolescence. And ODD status didn't make any difference to those odds ratios. In other words, it wasn't explained by comorbid oppositional disorder. So here is but another study demonstrating this strong risk that people with ADHD have toward substance use disorders, addiction more generally. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that in my next two video releases. Now, another paper that appeared uh, is related to my video just released a day or two ago, having to do with sleeping difficulties in children and adults with ADHD. Uh, this is a paper by um, some of my colleagues and friends, Steve Becker in particular, and others that you see listed here, was published in the Journal of Sleep Research uh, within the past week or two. And this is, a, again, a very large study of college students, 4,751 college students from five different universities who completed questionnaires about ADHD symptoms, about depression, about anxiety, and about their preference for morningness or eveningness in their life. This is what is known as your chronotype or your circadian preference. And as I mentioned in my earlier video, people with ADHD seem to be predisposed to a delayed diurnal peak. That is the peak of their alertness and wakefulness and their preference for alertness and wakefulness seems to be later than we see in typical individuals. And this study, in fact, finds that to be the case. Higher levels of ADHD were support, were uh, associated with, excuse me, with a preference for a eveningness 
over morningness compared to the general population. As you see here, this, the paper says that participants with either ADHD inattentive presentation or ADHD combined presentation had higher rates of being an evening type person. Look at the rates, 47% and 41% respectively of these two presentations of ADHD preferred eveningness over those participants who didn't have ADHD at all, where about 28% preferred eveningness. Uh, remember, this is college students who, where we generally find that they do have a slight preference for staying up later, studying in the evening, and so on. Now, this study also found that those with the predominantly inattentive presentation also had higher rates of preferring eveningness compared to those who were just hyperactive and impulsive. The difference isn't great. As you'll see here, about 30% of the hyperactives had an evening preference versus 47% of those with inattentive presentation. So overall, an association of ADHD with a preference for eveningness that is greater than we would see in the typical population of university students. They then went on to take a look at the affiliation of eveningness with not only ADHD, but they found that it seemed to help explain some of the relationship between ADHD and depression. So a preference for eveningness seemed to be to go along with a greater likelihood of reporting depressive symptoms. But there was no relationship of the symptoms or of evening preference with anxiety. So very, very interesting study. Again, showing what I mentioned earlier, that there is this preference for eveningness among adults with ADHD, in this case, college students. So uh, that should take care uh, of anyone who questions that relationship. A lot of good evidence piling up now on a sort of a delayed diurnal rhythm and evening preference for ADHD. Now, speaking of sleep, here's another article in the Journal of Sleep Research. This one addresses a question that I'm often asked, but for which there was almost no evidence available other than company uh, proposals and anecdotes about weighted blankets helping children with ADHD improve their sleep. Uh, and I was once asked whether I would even endorse this, and the answer was no, because there just wasn't any evidence one way or the other that a weighted blanket was better than an average blanket in helping ADHD kids with their sleep. So here comes a randomized trial from Sweden that takes 94 children who were diagnosed with ADHD and had verified sleep problems. So this isn't just ADHD kids overall. This is ADHD kids with sleeping difficulties. And it randomly assigned these children to either sleeping with a weighted blanket or with their blanket as usual, if you want to call it that, and looked at improvements in various aspects of sleep. So they were assessed at baseline four weeks later, eight weeks later. They were using questionnaires, a daily sleep diary, and even objective measures of activity during sleep known as an actograph. And what did they find? Well, they found that there was a slight but significant improvement in total sleep time in the kids who use the weighted blankets. How much? Eh, about seven to eight minutes of more sleep time than they would have had otherwise. It's certainly not clinically impressive, but statistically significant. They also reported an improvement in sleep efficiency uh, in the kids with the weighted blanket and um, that the individuals waking up after sleep onset was reduced by a few minutes, a little less than three minutes here, uh, in the group that had the weighted blanket over those who didn't. There was no difference, however, in the latency to falling asleep. That is, how long did it take to fall asleep? The weighted blanket kids didn't do any better than the regular kids. So overall, what we're seeing here is some slight evidence, albeit significant statistically, that a weighted blanket might improve sleep in ADHD children a little bit. Doesn't improve the onset of sleep, but it does seem to lead to slightly more sleep time and a little more efficient sleep and a little less 
waking at night. But I have to tell you, as a clinician, these figures of differences of two to seven minutes across these different measures is not particularly impressive when we hear about the complaints of families with these children with ADHD who talk about significant sleep problems in at least 40% of them. So uh, just like you might want to see one of the first studies I've seen that deals with uh, the efficacy of these weighted blankets. Uh, finally, I'm going to wrap it up with a review here of uh, reviews, believe it or not. So here's a review that went out and looked at all the other meta-analyses with regard to the issue of whether neonatal risk factors are linked to an increased risk of ADHD in children exposed to those risk factors. Uh, and I'll just cut to the short here. We've known about risk factors during the pregnancy, delivery, and neonatal period being elevated in children who went on to have ADHD. We know that they're legitimate risk factors. This isn't new in the research literature. Even back in the early 1970s, papers were appearing on the association of these pregnancy and early neonatal period risk factors with ADHD. But I bring this up only because here is a giant review of reviews. Uh, and what does it find? The results of this review showed that risk factors such as congenital heart disease, incomplete breastfeeding, that is a shorter period of breastfeeding, low birth weight, and having an APCAR score below seven at five minutes after birth were all risk factors linked to the development of ADHD symptoms later in childhood. They do say, however, that the quality of the research varied dramatically across these reviews, uh, and therefore these relationships can only be viewed as suggestive. So how, how do we interpret this? We know that the vast majority of ADHD is the result of genetic factors. But we also know that somewhere around 20 to 30% or more of cases of ADHD don't seem to be related to genetics, but are related to early exposure to biohazards and other factors that may create brain injury in individuals like significantly low birth weight, like congenital heart disease. So this review just reaffirms that fact that you can get ADHD by a variety of etiologies. There isn't just one. And one of those may be early injury to the developing brain as a consequence of having these other neonatal risk factors. So some children come by ADHD through an acquired injury. Others, the larger share of ADHD children and adults, came to it through genetic factors. So uh, a very interesting review uh, that was published here uh, in Clinical and Experimental Pediatrics just this past week. So, okay, well, there you have it. I got to get back to the assisted living facility. I hope that you have found this review useful. If so, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, and we'll see you again next week for another research review. Thanks for joining me. Be well, everybody. Bye now.